thanks everyone for joining this session. Uh, and uh, again, very uh, nice to see you in person uh, at GoToCon again in Chicago. So uh, my name is Kasun Indrasuri. Uh, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I've been working as a senior product manager at Microsoft, uh, primarily focusing on uh, data streaming and event streaming uh, side of the things. And also previously, I've been uh, mostly involved in uh, building event streaming platforms as well as enterprise integration platforms. So in the process, I authored a couple of books related to uh, cloud native design patterns, uh, gRPC, uh, and microservices. So without any further ado, let's get started with today's session. Uh, cloud building cloud native event streaming applications. Right. So uh, basically, in this session, I'll be focusing on uh, some of the key design principles uh, that you might have to follow when building event streaming applications. And uh, we'll look at the key aspects of uh, bringing or migrating your existing event streaming application to the cloud so that you can leverage cloud native event streaming uh, services out there. So <clears throat> a quick agenda of the session, uh, we will first look at why event streaming is important, uh, why you really need to use event streaming, event streaming technologies, and then how you can transform those uh, technologies to cloud native event streaming platforms as well as we'll take a closer look at some of the key pillars of an event streaming platform and uh, how you have to choose existing event streaming platforms out there and key considerations for doing that. And also as an implementation uh, uh, use case, I'll be talking about or going through some of the aspects that we follow at Azure uh, when building our event streaming uh, services and platforms. All right. So, uh, a quick show of hands. How many of you are use, currently using event streaming platforms like Kafka, uh, Kinesis, Azure? Yeah, it's pretty much, yeah, probably 80% of you, right? Yes, it's pretty cool. I've seen like most of the modern enterprise architecture diagrams as some part of uh, event streaming uh, solutions like Kafka, right? So, yeah, that's very cool to see. Now, uh, if you look at the business use cases for event streaming, right? So we are building multiple uh, software applications as part of to, to realize our business use cases, right? And uh, as part of these applications, uh, most of these applications generate very large volume of events, right? And and also any any business use case needs to deal with multiple events, uh, event sources, and as part of the business, uh, what you have to do is you have to collect uh, all these different events, store them, and process them to generate business insights. So there are multiple use cases related to event streaming, such as uh, analyzing or collecting web click streams, analyzing financial data coming in, and uh, detecting any anomalies or frauds as well as you have multiple applications you build, right? So you, if you are, especially when you are building microservices application, you need to collect all the different logs that are coming from multiple microservices and then analyze and generate insight out of that. So likewise, there are multiple use cases related to building event streaming. And uh, therefore, uh, it's becoming one of the most uh, important aspect of modern enterprise architecture. So, uh, and, Along with that, let's take a closer look at what event streaming is. So uh, at very abstract level, an event is a fact that something has happened, right? So for example, uh, in the case of a web, web click stream anal analytics solution, uh, when a given user clicks on a particular product of your retail application, for example, that's an event. So usually event streaming applications uh, don't get really much use of having discrete set of events, but these events need to be related to generate some business insight out of, out of that, right? So for example, again, using the same example, right? So uh, if this particular user has clicked on this product, but before that uh, he or she went through several other uh, interactions with your application or website, so therefore, that is where event streaming 
uh, or event stream uh, comes into the picture. So event stream is a collection of or a sequence of related events uh, that are ingested in a sequential way and in order to generate insights out of that, you need to process the entire event stream, not just one event. So that is where we define event streams. And as part of the solutions that we build, like uh, uh, event streaming platforms using Kafka or any other cloud services, you have the ingestion part, storing part, and the processing part. Now, that is where we define the terminology for an event streaming platform. As you can see in this diagram, there are multiple phases of uh, event streaming platform, right? So obviously you have the uh, source of the event stream, which is the trigger. So there are multiple sources. As you can see on your left, there are different event sources, uh, event streaming data coming from IoT devices, uh, user interaction with your website, uh, website and so on. And then you need an uh, event ingestion and storing layer. So in the context of Azure, we have uh, Azure Event Hubs, which is acting as sort of a central service that can collect all the different data coming from uh, multiple protocols like Kafka, AMQP, and so on. And so that, that is acting as the event ingestion layer as well as storing layer. So you ingest and store events. Then on top of the same data that you ingest, you can build different processing logics. So uh, depending on the use case, you might have to do real-time analytics, right? Uh, so you need to process the events in real time and generate business uh, insights right away, as well as you can do near real-time analytics. So that is where you do uh, sort of data exploring, uh, data analytics, uh, not necessarily real time, but probably near real time. And at the same time, uh, you don't really have to use a processing technology per se. You can uh, basically base your microservices application on top of the data that you ingest to Kafka or any other event streaming application and build your Kafka applic application on top of the event streams that you just ingest. Similarly, you can do batch analytics especially with Spark, uh, you can do uh, like data that you store in Kafka can be processed in badges or again, uh, Spark has Spark structured streams to process them real time as well. And uh, one aspect of event stream is uh, uh, in most event streaming, event ingestion solutions, you retain data for a limited period of time. It can range from few days to probably few months. But after that, uh, often those data, data become uh, stale. But if you want to retain data for, uh, for a long time to generate more uh, batch-like analytics wor workloads, then you can store data in uh, storage services uh, in the form of uh, uh, formats such as Avro, Parquet, and so on. Now, uh, so these are the key aspects of end-to-end -end event streaming architecture. Uh, so you can apply this. Uh, this is a common pattern that you can implement with any uh, solution out there. So you can use Kafka, on-prem Kafka, and then you can have your own microservices application processing them, as well as you can implement the same thing with pretty much with any cloud services uh, that you're using. Now, uh, our topic is all about cloud native event streaming, right? So let's take a closer look at what, uh, what are the key aspects of uh, cloud-native event streaming. Cloud-native is sort of an overloaded term, so I'm not going to sort of give my own definition of cloud-native. But rather, let's look at some of the uh, bottlenecks, some of the limitations that we uh, often see with existing event streaming solutions or event streaming brokers. Now, uh, how many of you, of you are currently running Kafka uh, on-prem or, or managing Kafka, uh, Kafka clusters. All right, I, I can see a few, few people, uh, quite a few people are using Kafka and managing uh, it by yourself. So uh, I think all these limitations, uh, I think most of you are familiar with these things, like the operation overhead, uh, starting from setting up a Kafka cluster, managing them, 
managing zookeeper or uh, care raft or whatever. So it'll be an, uh, sort of a daunting task. And when it comes to scale, if you want to uh, add no bro more broker nodes, it's again, uh, you need to go through a complex uh, process as well as uh, most organizations that we interact with, they do have separate Kafka team, a separate team just to manage your Kafka cluster, right? They're not doing anything else, but just manage and tune their Kafka clusters, which is again, a lot of work. And uh, also how you are going to achieve things such as uh, high availability, uh, make sure your Kafka clusters is uh, uh, resilient for uh, different disasters, right? That's, that's another major challenge. So uh, having uh, uh, all these uh, drawbacks uh, as part of our on-prem or managed uh, event streaming solutions, uh, that is where we need to take a closer look at how we can make these systems cloud native. Now, uh, this is, uh, I sort of came up with a definition for cloud native event stream. Uh, event streaming platform. So it's a fully managed event streaming platform that is composable. Uh, you can have multiple components like ingestion, processing, and uh, 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 modeling and serving layers, as well as scalable, high performant, resilient, high, uh, as well as observable. So you have the whole event streaming platform as a, as a service offered to you and you have all these characteristics available as part of it. Now, before I jump into the details of a cloud native uh, event streaming uh, characteristics, let's take a closer look at some of the key components of event ingestion. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll be mostly focusing on event ingestion side of the things, like the, Kaf the role of Kafka and other event brokers has to play because uh, that is probably the most important aspect of any event streaming platform. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this concept, but just to make sure that you are, uh, we all are in the same page, I'll cover some of the key, uh, key concepts. So in any event ingestion platform, uh, we have uh, event brokers, producers, and consumers. So event broker is the main event ingestion layer and all the producer applications producing data to it and the consumers basically consume data from the event streams. Usually events are organized into uh, topics, right? So you can uh, directly map a topic to a business context. So for example, if you are building a, a retail application, you can have uh, a topic for process orders. So basically you ingest all the order related data to that topic. And uh, most of these platforms use partition consumer model, where you basically partition your uh, topic into multiple partitions or shards so that you can parallelize the processing of the uh, events that you ingest. So you can think of partition as a way of scaling your event streams, uh, similar to having multiple lanes in, 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 in a freeway. Right? So if you need more throughput, you put more, uh, more partitions. If you need to uh, like less congestion in, uh, in a freeway, you put more lanes. Right? Then you can have more vehicles going uh, in the freeway. So similarly, we use partition consumer model. And on the, on the consumer side, uh, you can also organize consumers into multiple consumer groups. Uh, you can think of a consumer group as an individual or independent application. So each consumer group can independently consume the same data set. So uh, as we have seen previously, right? So if you want to do real-time uh, event processing, you can have a separate consumer group doing the real-time processing. At the same time, if you want to do batch analy analytics, then you can have another consumer group primarily running on top of Spark, processing the same data set. Now, in the uh, context of Azure, we are pretty much following the same uh, architectural patterns similar to Kafka, uh, AWS Kinesis, uh, and so on. So we have multiple topics, and each topic has partitions, and uh, we have different uh, communication protocols incoming and outgoing. 
Now, with that, uh, let's look at some of the key pillars of a cloud, uh, nat uh, cloud native event ingestion service. So basically, uh, I'll be going through all these things. Uh, these are more or less uh, when diagnostic uh, aspects of a cloud native event streaming platform, but I'll use uh, examples from Azure as and when needed. Okay, so let's start with multi-tenant uh, platform as a service with workload isolation, right? Now, when you are moving your uh, existing Kafka application to the cloud, a cloud service or a platform as a service usually is multi-tenant, right? So uh, if you are using any, uh, any cloud service that is meant to be used by multiple tenants, multiple customers, or multiple users, therefore, since we are running multi-tenancy under the covers in all these services, uh, there can be multiple requirements related to how your workload is handled within these solutions. So there can be, uh, depending on the use case, right? You may do, you may uh, you may experience cross-tenant interference uh, because this is a shared environment that you are using, but your workload needs to be uh, resilient of any cross-tenant interference. Cross-tenant in uh, interference in the sense of uh, when, when the same resources being shared with multiple uh, customers, you may experience some uh, glitches related to latency, fluctuating latency, and so on. But there can be workloads that, uh, that has uh, latency requirements, like uh, 99th percentile of latency needs to be below this point. But if you're using this kind of a shared environment, you might face different fluctuations. So as part of the requirements uh, when building these applications, you need, to have, you need to have the ability to choose the service depending on uh, the SLA requirement of the business use case. And security is another aspect, right? So you are using a shared uh, uh, infrastructure or shared uh, platform as a service. And your data, that the data that you ingest to these services are stored along with other, other tenants. And you need to have secured uh, both data at rest security as well as uh, wire level or protocol level uh, security along with the pass. And another requirement is even within your organization, right? there can be multiple workloads that has different priorities. So one of, one of the applications that you have may have uh, like uh, high latency requirements as well, high priority latency requirements whereas other applications are more or less uh, uh, more or less can uh, live with the high latency and if you want to prioritize workloads within your application or within your organization you need fine grain uh, resource governance with uh, all these event streaming solutions now when it comes to selecting uh, these platform as a service depending on the workload uh, as part of Azure, we are offering uh, uh, product tiers or SKUs. Now, these are the SKUs that, are, that we are currently offering as part of the Azure Event Hubs. So the main analogy that we are uh, providing is uh, it is similar to uh, traveling in a subway or a metro, whereas uh, that is sort of a standard uh, SKU is a shared environment. It is similar to traveling in a metro or a uh, subway. And premium is similar to you have, uh, you basically purchase reserved seats. You, your position within the train is guaranteed. And the dedicated is like you completely rented the train or something, right? So you, you, you own the train, you, you have the, uh, all the resources allocated to your uh, clusters and the service. Now with, uh, with the standard scale, it's a multi-tenant shared infrastructure. So it is ideal for uh, majority of the production workload that does not, does not have a very high uh, mission critical latency requirement. Uh, because it is shared, you may feel, you may, you may experience different, uh, uh, very high, uh, relatively high P99 values. And uh, also with the premium, if you need more consistency, uh, then premium might be the best option because you have uh, resource isolation at the tenant level. So when we are assigning resources, we ensure that you have sufficient resources allocated and uh, allocated consistently throughout uh, 
the service consumption. Dedicated clusters or dedicated uh, tier is commonly used for majority of the mission critical workloads. And if you have very high volume uh, requirements as well as low latency requirements, then we often recommend dedicated clusters. Now this is within, uh, like as a user, you can select any of these tiers and uh, build your workload on top of this. Now suppose uh, you are using one of these tiers, but still within that you need to implement uh, fine grain uh, access control. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. These are specific to Azure, but I think uh, this kind of tiers you can find across all the other event streaming uh, platforms as well. So uh, usually I think dedicated is quite common across all the uh, providers. Premium is something that we sort of uh, recently introduced. Uh, we need something in between standard and dedicated, uh, primarily for the cost uh, efficiency. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite common across other vendors. Now, within the same, uh, I would say, organization or application, you may have different workload requirement, right? So suppose uh, you have two client applications uh, in ingesting data uh, to a event streaming solution, but you need to prioritize the data coming from one application, then uh, you can basically define uh, a throttling policy against the application uh, ID. So this is something that probably unique to Azure and Azure Event Hubs. So this level of granularity and the throttling capabilities are not available even in the Kafka ecosystem. Now, uh, with this, you can uh, define access policies, uh, like throttling policies, as well as you can completely cut off the traffic coming from a particular application ID. And application ID directly related to the security context of your application. So suppose two applications are using two different tokens, and uh, that is, uh, so, and, and you can, from the service level, you can cut off the traffic from, I mean, from one particular token and uh, allow the other application to use your service. Now, the important aspect of this is one service or one application cannot really exhaust all the resources allocated to your uh, Kafka cluster, for example, right? So you always prioritize the application that needs priority. All right, so then we can move on to our next uh, pillar, multi-protocol event streaming. So usually most of the event streaming uh, solutions out there, so they need to have the interoperability with uh, multiple source and target systems, right? So uh, obviously if you're using Kafka and uh, Kafka is probably the most prominent protocol when it comes to event streaming, but uh, as part of an event streaming service, we uh, always recommend to have a, select a service that has multiple protocol native support. Like uh, in, in the context of Azure Event Hubs, we have support for AMQP, Kafka, uh, HTTPS, and WebSockets. Uh, but uh, if you are choosing a, a solution, uh, it's always good to mix and match these protocols because there are solutions that are because there are so many Kafka libraries out there and there are so many Kafka producers and consumers that you can use the service with. As well as uh, the, uh, some protocols like MQP are more suitable to uh, handle very large volume of event streams compared to Kafka. So therefore, uh, we recommend to use these different protocols. Along with that, we also need support for multiple uh, sources and syncs. That is where things such as uh, Kafka Connect uh, comes into the picture. Right? So with Kafka Connect, uh, still you can use uh, data coming from multiple systems and so sources and things uh, and integrate uh, without uh, writing custom code to your event streaming, uh, event ingestion engine. And uh, also as part of this, we recommend mixing and matching these protocols. Your incoming protocol can be Kafka, your consumer protocol can be AMQP. So as part of Event Hubs, we have support for uh, three native protocols, Kafka, MQP, and HTTPS. And uh, consumer side, we have support for Kafka and AMQP. And for any different uh, source and target systems, we have Kafka Connect-based uh, connectivity as well. 
All right. So now let's look at the net next aspect of uh, cloud native event streaming. Uh, that is high performance event streaming. So uh, performance can be uh, defined in multiple ways uh, in terms of the event streaming platforms, right? So it can be uh, ingestion throughput, uh, how quickly you can ingest data to an event streaming service such as Kafka. And uh, so in, in that context, you would primarily measure the latency of uh, producing data and getting an acknowledgement from the producer side. Uh, but also you can also look at the end-to-end -end latency. So from the producer to all the way down to the consumer, you can uh, measure the latency, right? From the ingestion time to the consumption time, you can measure the latency and that defines the end-to-end -end latency. So usually with uh, all these different uh, cloud-native solutions, uh, especially if you have moved from on-prem uh, event streaming broker to, to a cloud-based one or a platform as a service, performance can be an important aspect. So you would most probably expect the same performance as you had with on-prem with uh, platform as a service solution as well. So sort of there's a sort of a misconception on you won't be able to achieve same performance with uh, cloud-based or PaaS solutions, but uh, most of the vendors in this space are consistently improving their performance to match the same uh, same or better performance as with their on-prem system. Now, in terms of uh, measuring the performance, there are multiple uh, frameworks available. One of the most common ones, uh, one of the most popular frameworks uh, uh, is uh, Open Messaging Benchmark. Uh, it is similar to uh, like benchmarking your RESTful service, but the, in this case, we are benchmarking broker solutions like Kafka, Pulsa. There are multiple adapters available for different uh, broker solutions. It's an open source uh, Linux foundation project. So we heavily use this framework to build our own uh, performance benchmarks as well. Now, one advantage that you get with cloud native uh, event streaming is that you don't really have to tune your clusters. It is already being done by the cloud provider. So only thing that you need to sort of optimize is your client side parameters, right? So uh, for example, if you are using Kafka, you can optimize your batch size, uh, linger, millisecond si uh, linger millisecond interval, as well as the acts that you use at the producer level. So that is another advantage that you get with these uh, pass based event streaming platforms. Now, some of the uh, latency measurements that we did with Azure Event Hubs, we recently done. Uh, we, we recently introduced our premium SKU as well as uh, a new dedicated SKU. So, with all these latency impro uh, performance improvements, uh, as you can see, we have seen like less than ten millisecond of end-to-end -end latency from producer to consumer, and uh, also the consistency. Uh, the chart at the bottom, you can see. A comparison between Azure Event Hubs and another popular cloud uh, Kafka cloud provider, you can see the latency fluctuation for the same, uh, like a similar cluster. And also, uh, we had multiple customers uh, who are using uh, this service for mission critical workloads, and uh, some of the requirements were to have uh, P99 9 below uh, a certain level, like. Uh, the, 30 milliseconds in this case. So with these new clusters, we managed to achieve, uh, as you can see, right, uh, average less than 10 millisecond, P99 around 30 millisecond. Uh, and if you are new to uh, the 99th percentile, that means 99% uh, of your uh, latency values are below 30 milliseconds. So that's an important measurement uh, in any uh, event streaming platform. So, uh, it's, it's important to measure. If you, if you are migrating from an existing uh, Kafka uh, cluster to a, a cloud provider, it's very important to measure the latency as well as the throughput. And that's why a benchmarking framework such as Open Messaging Benchmark uh, can come in uh, really handy. All right, so let's talk about uh, high availability in cloud native event streaming platforms. So high availability can come in uh, 
different forms. Uh, so you, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, replicas in the context of Kafka, right? So in Kafka clusters, you have replicas, same data being replicated across multiple broker nodes within one cluster. So failure in one of those nodes still can, uh, uh, can resilient uh, from data losses. So within one cluster, that is what you can do. And uh, so as part of the event hubs also, we have something called fault domains. Uh, so each fault domain, uh, they have, uh, they are resilient for rack failures, uh, network failures and so on. So that is within one cluster. But how about within the data center? So one of the main advantage that you get from uh, all these PaaS services uh, that support event streaming, you can enable availability zones. So availability zone is, a, uh, you can think of it as a three different data centers residing in one particular region, like US Central. Central has three physically separated data centers. And then they have uh, independent, completely independent uh, network, uh, cooling, and also independent power supply. So one failure of a data center still can keep your systems running, right? So that's why we need to enable availability zones as part of the solution. So in most cases, is, is, uh, uh, it's not something that you have to specifically configure. It's built into the service and replication happens seamlessly as part of the application developer or the administrator of these clusters. You don't really have to do any manual operation. You just probably within a uh, single click, you can just enable AZs for your cluster and it will take care of it. So if there's a failure of a particular data center, still you will have the same state preserved across at least two more data centers and uh, you can your application can seamlessly uh, switch over from one, uh, one data center to the other without doing any code change. Now availability zones only applicable for within one region, right? within one within us central you can have azs but how about if there is a region failure so region failures are not uh, it's very rare but there are even a couple of region failures across uh, different cloud providers so how you can uh, you need to be uh, resilient of these uh, region failures is where you implement multi region uh, disaster recovery now, with this approach, you build your system spanning across multiple regions. So one uh, event streaming application or event streaming service reside in US Central, and then you have another uh, DR region, uh, maybe US West. So then you create a topology uh, between US Central and US West and enable disaster recovery. Now, one of the main challenge with this approach is you, uh, even if you configure to have it seamless, there is a lag between, due to the obvious reasons of having two regions and latency of uh, network communication between two regions, there's a lag. So uh, therefore, you need to basically, as part of the event streaming platform, you need to replicate multiple things. You need, you need to replicate uh, all the data that you ingest, right? all the event data, as well as all the metadata. The topics, partitions, consumer groups, everything needs to be replicated across these regions. And uh, also, as part of the consumers, uh, if you're coming from a Kafka background, uh, you're committing your Kafka offsets from the consumer side. So if you switch from one region to the other, you need to start from where you left off at the consumer side. So replicating all these things are really challenging. And also you have different replication consistency considerations. Right? You can do synchronous replication, uh, which means you ingest data to your primary region and you need to have it available immediately in the secondary region as well, which will add additional latency to your producing operations. Or you can choose to have async replication where you do synchronization uh, offline without impacting the producers. Now, uh, most of the cloud uh, providers, they do have some form of uh, DR options available. Uh, most are metadata 
currently most are based on metadata. For uh, data replication, you often need to use uh, solutions like uh, Mirror Maker under the covers, and you need to implement those uh, technologies. All right, so now let's take a closer look at uh, scaling aspect of uh, cloud native event streams. Now, scaling is, uh, especially with event streaming, uh, scaling can be a pretty uh, daunting task, especially if you are building your on-prem uh, uh, event streaming platforms. You need to add more broken nodes, more resources to your clusters. But if you are using cloud service, uh, you can choose to have uh, dynamic scaling. So depending on the data coming in, number of events or megabyte per second or number of events coming in, you can uh, have more resources allocated to your cluster. So basically you allocate scale units when you create these pass uh, resources and you can basically uh, have things such as uh, auto, auto scaling for these resources. Now it can uh, also done uh, at the partition level as I explained earlier. So if you need to get more throughput out of your existing infrastructure without adding more resources, you can add more partitions. And uh, also uh, you can change the partition count, primarily increase the partition count as needed without impacting the uh, client applications. But bringing down the partition count is not something we recommend. So scaling can be done, like uh, you can do dynamic scaling, but then cost uh, of event streaming uh, can come into the picture very soon. So because we are dealing with very large volume of data, uh, you need to be uh, really concerned about the overall uh, cost efficiency of your event streaming solutions. So uh, most of the event streaming solutions, uh, they do have multiple uh, pricing model. Uh, one can be based on the usage, based on the number of that you number of events that you ingest as well as number of uh, bytes that you ingest or consume. Uh, so that is usage-based pricing. Or there can be capacity allocation-based pricing. So usage-based pricing can become really expensive if you, are, if you are ingesting very large volume of data. So that is where you need to switch to capacity allocated, allocation-based pricing, where you allocate certain capacity for your cluster and your paying a fixed amount for that cluster, but those clusters have very high uh, uh, data volume uh, capabilities. So it's very important to look at uh, your workload and determine what is the most suitable pricing model. So any cloud service, uh, Azure has a, a standard SKU, which is standard SKU of Event Hub, which is usage-based pricing, uh, then premium and dedicated are uh, more of a uh, capacity allocation based pricing. All right, so one other aspect of uh, cloud native event streaming is uh, event uh, stream governance. Uh, if you are coming from a microservices background, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, service contracts, right? So you define service contract for your service, your, your uh, client applications adheres to that contract. But how about using the same principle for event streams? producers and consumers, how they uh, adhere to a particular schema. So that is where streaming, uh, stream governance uh, uh, comes into the picture. So with the schema registry solutions, you define uh, a central repository where you maintain all the schemas related to event streams. You can define streams using Avro, uh, JSON schema or protobuf. And then from the consumer application level, you consume this streamer these schemas and ensure that the data that you produce and consume are adhering to the schema. Another aspect of uh, stream governance can be the lineage. Uh, as I showed you earlier, there can be multiple services and applications in a one event streaming pipeline. From the producer to the ingestion layer to the consumer, you need to take a closer look at the lineage of data between all these systems. And uh, basically with stream lineage, you can uh, uh, double click on various aspect of uh, data streaming, uh, the flow of data and generate more insights uh, as a administrator of the event stream. Finally, uh, security, uh, data at rest uh, security. 
Uh, so, uh, as I explained, security is a major concern uh, when you are moving to a PaaS service. You need to ensure that data that you ingest are secured when we store them. We usually uh, rec- we usually encrypt using server managed uh, certificate or server managed keys. But also, you can provide your own key so that uh, you can ensure that nobody can touch us, even the, including the PaaS provider. So you can provide your uh, user manage or customer manage keys to encrypt data at rest. And data in motion usually controlled with wire level security and TLS. And uh, also you can use uh, things such as uh, a network security components, especially if you are exposing these uh, PaaS services to, to the public internet, then you can do IP filtering on top of these services. And, uh, and if you don't want to expose it to the public internet, then you can create private endpoints uh, within your virtual network. You run your service only within that and bringing the service to your network. And the other aspect is uh, role ba- uh, uh, RBAC and manage identity, role-based access control. So this is where you uh, integrate all the event streaming applications with a centralized uh, identity provider such as uh, Azure Active Directory to use manager identity when uh, consuming and producing data. All right, so I think uh, I hope that gives you a good understanding about some of the aspects that you need to consider when selecting an event streaming platform. Uh, I'll take a closer look at, uh, a quick look at uh, some of the aspects uh, of event, uh, Azure Event Hubs uh, under, the, under the hood. So I think I, I covered, I already covered some aspect of it, like uh, Azure Event Hub is a uh, real-time data streaming platform uh, that supports Kafka, MQP, and HTTPS as communication protocols. Uh, and you can bring in any existing Kafka workloads to Azure Event Hub without doing any code change uh, because it's fully compatible. But the most interesting aspect is the uh, internal architecture of Azure Event Hubs. So we follow a three-tier model uh, where we have uh, gateway, backend, and storage. So gateway is, you can think of it as the uh, front door to your event streaming platform, right? So all the, uh, all, the, all the events that you ingest or consume goes through the gateway. And gateway, as you can see, there are multiple uh, event streaming protocols, including Kafka, MQP, HTTPS, and so on. So Gateway is basically enforcing all the security consideration. This is where all the uh, transport level security is uh, validated, as well as any tokens that you are sending along with the request. And also it's uh, it's doing protocol canonicalization. Right? There, there are multiple incoming protocols, but uh, beyond Gateway, the, uh, we are using MQP as the internal protocol to communicate with brokers. So unlike Kafka, with event hubs, you get a single stable endpoint. You don't really get uh, like a broker endpoints. You get a single stable endpoint. And Gateway will determine how to route this request based on the partition ID as well as the topic name. And on the backend layer, it's all about uh, how you run your topic partition. Right? Each topic partition uh, is assigned to a broker node. And this is where I use uh, basically implement partitioning uh, as well as storing data uh, into a storage layer. Now, uh, with the storage layer, there are multiple ways that you store data. Uh, so in Azure, we use two-tier storage engine architecture where we directly ingest data to a local storage to achieve performance. And then later, uh, with offline synchronization, we are adding data back to Azure storage service uh, without impacting performance. So under the covers, we use uh, virtual machines. Uh, uh, we use a service called virtual machine uh, scale sets, uh, where you can uh, manage a, a, a family of virtual machines and automatically scale up or down as needed. and. Uh, on top of uh, VM scale sets, we are using uh, Azure Service Fabric, which is basically supporting all the leader election, leader lookup, uh, process placement, as well as uh, managing all the updates that goes as part of the service. Right? So this is sort of a coordination engine uh, 
uh, zookeeper, sort of a zookeeper-like uh, functionality uh, that you would see with uh, Kafka-like solutions. So basically, on top of service fabric, you manage all these different VMs and processors, and that is where uh, basically the gateway and backend nodes are implemented. So service fabric is implemented at both uh, gateway and backend layers, and each process. Uh, uh, so these process containers are not necessarily Docker containers. These are our own uh, definition of a container running inside, uh, running on top of service fabric. And uh, when it comes to workload isolation, so these processes can be assigned to uh, different, uh, basically you can assign resources specifically to these processes so that you would have sufficient cores and memory allocated all the time. So even if there is a contention for the resources, we will make sure that you have sufficient CPU and memory allocated so you won't see any performance fluctuation with uh, that allocation. And uh, finally, with uh, uh, storage layer, as I mentioned earlier, we are using uh, a concept of a local storage versus cloud storage. So each process that we run, they contain a NVMe-based local storage, which is very high-performant uh, local storage. So as soon as you get a request, we write the request or, or, or an event uh, to this local storage and immediately acknowledge the client. And uh, once this uh, local blob store and local blobs goes beyond a certain limit, then we write it back to a Azure Storage Engine account uh, behind the scenes without impacting the uh, client applications. So yeah, so I'm uh, not going to go into the details of this, but I uh, just want to give you some um, insights about how we have implemented the service under the covers. All right, I think uh, with that, I would like to conclude the session on uh, cloud, uh, cloud native event streams. I want to give a few minutes to uh, address any of the questions that you have.